Hey there, everyone. Evan Damrell, co-host of Locked on Cavs, here again for the second day in a row without my partner in crime, Chris Manning. While Chris Manning recovers after trying to recreate the infamous bear scene in The Revenant, I'm joined once again by Channel 19's Bailey Birdmaster, where we touch base on her feelings about the Cavs season overall, as well as what we're looking forward to in Wednesday's night's tilt against the Philadelphia 76ers. Without further ado, let's get into it with a new intro. Cavs need a three. Sexton works on Irving, trying to get loose. He'll fire. He knocks it down. Ground. Here goes Okoro to the bucket. And oh, my. Okoro throws it down. Ten seconds to go. Here comes Colin Sexton. Sexton chased by Hill. Off to Stevens. Oh, my. 45 ticks to go. That shot yes. is blocked by Nance. Get that big stuff out of here. Prince knocks down that hard and pass. Garland's there. Garland upstairs for Allen. Oh, 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 look out. There you go. That's called team ball right there. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone again for making Locked On Cavs your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to start, subscribe to us on YouTube. And if you help us get to 1500 by Friday, I promise you, everyone, I'll do a dry scoop serving athletic of Athletic Greens. But more about them on Thursday and Friday show because that's when they're actually sponsoring us. And I already introduced her at the top, but I'm again joined by Channel 19's Bailey Brewmaster. And I got to ask, Bailey, how's Brown's free agency treating you right now? Oh, man, it's kicking my butt, to put it nicely. I mean, I usually work like a 3.30 to 11.30 shift. And, you know, there. they sent me the email, hey, we're going to be on standby. You probably need to get here at 11. Had a hit at noon, the 4, the 5. I feel like there's it's just developing and it's very fluid. I think it's all going to come to a head here very soon where uh, quarterback Baker Mayfield's concerned. Well, what do you mean by uh, what do you mean coming to a head? Let me hear what you think, because I have my feelings and I'll keep them to myself, but I want to hear what you think. Okay, so like this is me first talking about it publicly. Um, oh, you know, there's two things I'll say that really stand out to me in all of this. The first is if you're Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski, you have preached over and over again since the end of season that. Baker is QB one. He is your guy. Now, what are what else are they really gonna say? Uh, you know, they kind of yeah, yeah show fans, right. Um, but you do not go all in private jet to Houston to scoop Watson if you don't have a good feeling that you can snag him. Now, I think where it gets spotty is you know Watson. It's in the balls in Watson's court completely of where he wants to mm -hmm. go, but. The Browns seem, in my opinion, the best roster, the best situation to go to. Now, does he want to come to Cleveland? I don't know. But from a Browns organization standpoint, they are going all in. And when you go all in, you are lighting a match to burn the Baker Bridge. Um, so when I look at that, I find it very, very hard. You can walk this back. Uh, put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak. I mean, I, I would not be surprised if Baker is – gone no matter how this well whether they get Watson or not you know mm -hmm. uh, that would not surprise me at all the other thing that stands out to me you know it was very clear who the cap casualties might be you know Jarvis Landry was always a big possibility he was gone because of his cap number same with JC Treader. Case Keenum was in that boat let's not forget that and mm -hmm. Case Keenum is still on the roster is he the insurance policy if they do get Watson and you need someone to manage and come in who knows the offense, who knows Stefanski, who abides by Stefanski? Uh, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. I don't know what there's no, nothing there, but that's just me making an opinion about what's going on. I will say I think it's very interesting and very telling Um about this front office that they are just going full throttle towards Watson. And I mean, it's coming down to Browns, Panthers, Saints, Falcons. I don't know how much I believe this Falcon smoke necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but man, uh, I mean, what a mess. I think a mess is a good way to put it. And the way you break I mean, it down I like that, um, I'm personally, 
from a from a personal standpoint, I think you cannot walk this back at this point because you've publicly gone on the record during the draft combine that Baker Mayfield's your guy. And then you are flirting with another quarterback quite publicly at this point. It's no secret the Browns are there. I think every NFL insider at this point said the Browns met with Deshaun Watson on Tuesday. And if you're Baker Mayfield, you're already the relationship's are already a little bit icy, I'd say, a little bit of friction between you and the Browns. I think this might be the nail in the coffin just because Baker Mayfield seems like that petty of a guy where he'd like feel like this one slight against him was just enough just to say, you know what, trade me at this point. And I, like you said, I think there is some fire to this smoke. Um, if I were Deshaun Watson, I'd have to pick Cleveland. If I, more than anything, just whether it's between them, New Orleans, which has so many ans- questions and not that many answers, and the Panthers, who may have a different head coach this time next year. Um, from a personal standpoint, I'd prefer them not to get Deshaun Watson just because I know women who survive sexual assault, and I just don't know if I can willingly root and cover for a Browns team without saying, like, uh, this is grimy. And, like, you give Pittsburgh fans grief for so many years about what Roethlisberger did, and that's where it gets even dicier for me. So I think I'd rather let some other team's fan base swallow that pill. But the Case well, Keenum I mean, argument and things – oh, no, go ahead. I mean, I was just going to talk about the sexual assault stuff. I mean, how I look at it is it's 22 women are not lying. Yep. Um and there's a consistency in all the stories. There are, if you look deeply in this case, there are some gray areas that I could see people being combative on. I understand that. But 22 women are not lying, and there are consistencies on Watson's end of things. And, you know, I'm a big, I don't condone that. I don't like mm-hmm. covering people like that. But guess what? We're in the NFL. And in the NFL, um, I'll ask the question, what have you seen on where they stand on the treatment of women when it comes to mm-hmm. sexual harassment? No, I absolutely agree. And we'll put a pin in the Browns talk for now. Check out Locked on Browns if you want to hear more on just the debacle that's happening. But the Case Keenum aspect is a really good point, too. I do think he is Kevin Stefanski's guy just from their time together in Minnesota. But it is a grim reality to say, I think I'd rather see what the Browns have with maybe a healthy Baker Mayfield than asking Case Keenum to trot out there and be the starting quarterback week one against whoever they play. Like, that just seems suboptimal for the Browns if you're trying to build a quote unquote championship contender. And they're they're making the moves. Like you said, they cut Treader and they cut Landry to save cap space. They bring in Amari Cooper, even though he's making a ton of money over the next few years. There's gonna be a lot of tough decisions they have to face. And I don't know. I, I I'm curious to see how this all just kind of folds out. Yeah, it's um gonna be very interesting. I will say, like, you know, I was mm-hmm. on the Packers beat for two years. And you know, it's covering Aaron Rodgers, you deal with drama. I have never dealt with something like this where it literally feels like something every week and you're just mm-hmm. like trying to stay above water with the latest. Oh, no, I absolutely get that. But on a more semi-positive note, I want to say, uh, this isn't a cheery conversation because for those who may be regular listeners, we had Bailey on a few weeks ago, or I had Bailey on a few weeks ago, and we chat, chat, we're chatting about the Cavs. And I think the key walk away for both of us just after that conversation was we were both pretty, I'd say, overwhelmingly positive about this Cavs team. And we were texting about it a little bit last night. And you're like, my feelings have changed a little bit with like a grimacing emoji. So I'm going to open the floor to you. We'll just set the table here. We'll take a break after that. But let me hear why maybe your feelings have changed a little bit between now and three, four weeks ago because I'm bad at keeping a calendar. Yeah, yeah. It was the emoji. Um, How I told you, you know, I'm big on teams getting in a rhythm, playing their best ball at the right time. And I just don't feel like the Caps have necessarily taken a step in the right direction. And I don't think that's any – you know, discredit to anyone involved as much as it is these injuries. You know, we talked last time about them getting healthy, seeing what was there, seeing how Levert kind of adapts in this system and gets going. And then there's an injury. Then Rondo has an injury. Then Allen's finger. And what a blow. Allen being just the tipping point right there. And you know, I, I know there was a report today that, you know, he might he's not going to get surgery and he might mm-hmm. try and come back in time for playoffs. That's great if so, but who knows how that's going to go and who knows what type of player he'll be and how that will affect things. But it's really the injuries that have just been like 
the dagger for me lately when it looks at the momentum of where this team is, especially when you look at, you know, Garland still do being Garland, but how long can you keep that up before you get to the playoffs? How sustainable is that? I mean, there comes a point where you have to be exhausted and like all credit to Evan Mobley. I am so impressed with him. I, I uh, went to Oklahoma state. So I've been a Cade Cunningham fan. I've sung his praises, but I'm sitting here like, ah, like rookie of the year type situation. I don't know how you deny Evan Mobley in a way. Uh, I just find his ability offensively, but then defensively and how lately he's really just stepped up big. It's fascinating. And I think mm-hmm. it's something that I love, he kind of has some Nick Chubb in him in a sense that he's just egoless. He just wants to go yeah. ball. And like, I love that about him, but he's also young. So yeah. how sustainable is he down the stretch to pick up, you know, and fill in for Allen in a way it's I'm concerned. I think mm-hmm. I'm a lot more concerned than I was a few weeks ago. No, I think you have every right to be concerned. I think a lot of fans themselves are concerned. The Cavs have looked ugly more often than not. You can correct me on that, but they've looked bad in March. And I think injuries have really taken their toll. And you and I are um, absolutely on the same page. There's just been suboptimal timing just across the board post All-Star break. I think the Garland injury just like really put a damper on the mood. And then Rondo getting hurt and Levert getting hurt in practice just really set the Cavs up for failure to kind of start the All-Star, post All-Star break life for them. And I don't know. I, I have some thoughts. I we will talk about them for sure, but we got to get a quick word in from today's one of today's sponsors. But Evan Mobley, it's just an Evan thing. It's just greatness is always predestined when that's your first name. I'd say. Thank you for just <laughs> humble yourself. Humble yourself. And I'm I'm incredibly humble. I'm one of the most humble and people I know, but. If you want to get in on maybe not some humility, check out today's sponsor, Bet Online. It's that time of year again as college basketball's tournament is finally upon us. From all the latest odds, contests, and player ops, BetOnline.net is the number one source for all your sports betting needs and info. Bet Online remains the best spot for all your sports, scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games as well. So, if you're interested, head to the website today and use your mobile device to learn more about their trends in action. BetOnline.net, where the game starts. Welcome back, and thank you for making Locked On Cast your first listen. For your next listen, check out Locked On Now podcast. They feature nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from local experts like myself. Funny, I call myself that. Humility just left and right. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. So, I'll be right back into this conversation. Bailey, we were talking about the injuries. I want to focus on that first. Do you think they're going to be able to bounce back? Because I think that report saying that there's optimism in Jared Allen could be back before the playoffs because it didn't seem like that because JB Bickerstaff got pressed on it a little bit. And he said, I don't know multiple times or if he'd be back for the regular season or not. And that certainly put a damper on the mood because I think it really puts into perspective because it goes hand in hand with your Mobley argument too, that, is this sustainable? Because with Allen out, it's become more and more increasingly clear to people, especially myself, just watching like how important he is to this team on both ends of the floor and whether or not the Cavs just kind of have enough juice in them to ride this out until he hopefully comes back. I mean, there's less than 20 games left in the season. And it's just, I wonder if that injury, because like the Garland injury, I think the Cavs have kind of ridden this wave a few times and they're able to patchwork things together. I think them getting hit with like almost all their guard depth being decimated by injuries, not good. And like Brandon Goodwin played great. I think that was a fun story in itself, but they were able to somehow survive that. And they're definitely just looking a lot worse without Jared Allen out there. And I think it just really puts into like significance just how important he is to what the Cavs are trying to do on both ends. Yeah, and I think I think the question is different. I don't think it's, can they survive certain injuries? Because I think they've proven they can. I think the question is, how long can they do that? And that's That's where I start to get really concerned. Um, There's, there's times where I feel like, wow, they're real. JB uses the word gritty, gritty performances. And like, that's where they're at right now. But there comes a point where you run out of grit. It's like you run out of grit. Like, I don't want to say they're not trying. It's just like the guys are tired. There's only so much you can do to fill those holes until you can Mm -hmm. get those people back. And when it comes to Allen, I mean, that's a huge blow. And 
I think that's just, I don't know how you sustain for so long. I'm not saying they can't. I'm mm-hmm. just saying I'm not opt- as optimistic as I was. I think what helps is I think eight of their next nine games are at home and they're fairly good at home and the yeah. crowd can definitely help. Them. Um, so I think that's definitely helpful for them, but uh, and when you look at Allen, you know, with that report and JB saying, I don't know, I think it, it starts another conversation of managing expectations. And this is what something was brought up at my station. You know, we have a, we have a lot of local people who big Cavs fan get big Browns fans. And someone said, you know, if they don't make the playoffs, it's a disappointing year. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I got so defensive. I, I, I want to hear this. Emotion. People walking around being like, so how many wins do you think the Cavs are going to have this year? 20 wins? 20? Maybe 25? You cannot sit here and one at the beginning of the year be like, they're only going to win 25 games, and now they might be in the playoffs. Beggars can't be choosers. I think exactly. no matter if it's the playoffs or not, the Cavs had a successful season. They got better. They developed in the way they want to, and there's a lot of promise for the future. Next year, you can have those expectations. But this year, that, oh, that just irked me. And that's something, and I will get crucified for this, but I, I, I can take it. I'm in one of those. I can take the heat. Expectations for Cleveland sports are barbaric. No, no, that's... Like you, 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 you have a safe home between myself and my <laughs> co-host because we... When the Cavs were really winning, we're like, guys, let's pump the brakes a little bit because a lot of people are like, all right, it's a championship or bust. I'm just like, no, we should just be. And people were upset because I went on a round table with like the playoff contenders, and they're like, Evan, what are your thoughts? I'm like, I just think the Cavs are happy to be here right now. Like, yeah. let's be frank. Like, they're the like, expectations were so low, and yes, they kept raising the ceiling and raising the ceiling and raising the ceiling, and their perceived expectations. And it's not to, that- say, that- and it's not to say they shouldn't be in the playoffs yeah. and try and get there. I think it's still That's, a very big exactly. possibility. But people who are saying, oh, it's a failure, miss me, are the same people who are like, they're going to win five games this season. I. It's the same thing with the Browns, though. It's like, oh, our roster is the best in the league. We're going to the Super Bowl. No, that's not how it works. I covered the Packers back-to-back years. They went to back-to-back NFC championships and lost. And they have – a back-to-back MVP is their quarterback. Uh-huh. Like, just because you have the best roster doesn't always equate to you're going to a championship. And, like, great yeah. things take time, and there must be patience in that process. I think time and patience are the paramount things. And I think people maybe got a little too I, – I do wonder if maybe the Browns just kind of falling flat on their face this season really amplified, like, the Cavs' early season success. They're like, oh, my gosh, this team had, like, zero expectations and they're just on fire right now. And people will probably drag me and roast me, but I just don't look at it anymore because I can't take it. I'm not as strong as you are. But um, it's definitely just interesting to think about – what like because like I absolutely agree the expectations were very low for this cast team and they were kind of the butt of the joke like a lot of people didn't think they were going to win games I was talking to a friend like there's probably a different reality where people are watching the Cavs and they are more so fascinated on who's going to perform, perform well during March Madness for the remainder of spring because that's who the Cavs should be targeting in the draft instead Cleveland punted on their draft pick this year went and got Karis LeVert because they have something here and I think that's exciting. Like that's fun. And I absolutely agree. Like it is a little Cleveland to say, well, there's always next year, but I, I think they're going to make the playoffs at this point. I think it's going to be tougher. Um, just given the injuries, just to kind of circle back to the beginning of the conversation, I think it's going to be tough sledding just here on out because Toronto is just going to be a thorn in their side just for the rest of the way until they kind of widen the gap, maybe a little bit. I, I don't think they're going to host a first round playoff series, unfortunately, just because Boston and Chicago and Milwaukee and Philly just are kind of widening their gap a little bit. And they're just more talented and have more experience and it's tough. And like you said at the very beginning, how can they sustain this? Like, that's a very good question because Garland is playing out of his mind again, but there's the, always going to be the fear in the back of my mind, like, okay, well, what if his back flares up again? Or what if it's another freak injury? Or what if another just another major injury happens? Like, knock on wood that nothing does, but the Cavs keep taking hits, and there's something endearing in the fact that they keep taking these hits, and they keep getting up and keep fighting and keep 
scrapping and showing grip. Yeah, they keep showing up. And I do worry, though, because they are a team in their early 20s. A lot of them haven't played a full NBA season, just theoretically speaking, and the playoffs included. And maybe there's a little bit of pressure with that. And maybe they're a little bit in their heads just because of the pressure of the standings. I know JB will say, like, there's no pressure. We don't feel any pressure. But, like, you can say it, but it's a different thing on the floor, too. And maybe they are just a little tired, too, because they've had to, like, ask other guys to really step up in, like, dramatic fashion to kind of account for some of the losses they dealt with this year. And it's just – it's hitting them all the wrong ways at the wrong time right now. Well, and you you got to take into account, too, that they have a lot of people who – probably haven't been in the position of the playoffs. Yeah, you have vet guys with good heads on their shoulders like Kevin Love who can, you know, talk them through those things. But experience is experience. And you have to know that feeling. You have to know the level that's increased at that point. Uh, And it's uncharted waters. And so imagine Mm -hmm. dealing with that along with the injuries and the tiredness. And on top of that, like, I especially when everyone was like this team, this culture, it's thriving. And JB was kind of like, we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. And like, rightfully so, you know, because when this happens, then it's the alternate reaction. Yep. And how do you deal with that? And how do you not let that get in your head? So it's finding that balance in all of this, which is really hard while they're dealing with adversity. No, I absolutely agree. And it's, to put a pin in this conversation, are you still optimistic about them? Just maybe have a little bit more reservations just kind of just because things kind of out of their control at this point have hit them at the wrong time. Yeah, I feel like a lot of Cleveland sports fans love to hit the panic button as soon as yeah. things start to go south because they're used to a slippery slope. Like what's going on with the Browns now? When something starts going like this, it's like oh panic, panic, panic. No, I I still love this Cavs team as much as I did. I'm still optimistic about them. I just think it depends on how things trend with them injury wise and responding to that. And like I said, how long they can keep responding to that given the circumstances. No, I absolutely agree. And I think that's just a good way to just kind of take another break. And we'll talk a little bit about Evan Mobley because he's going to have to handle one Joel Embiid Wednesday night. So I think that's a good way to talk about his growth and progression too. But just want to give a quick word from today's sponsor, Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it is now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Wind are often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend up to 30%, 50%, or even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselves for over 20 years. And if you're interested, go use their easy-to-use website today and find a solution for your auto parts needs. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in there. How did you hear about this box new that we set? Amazing selection, reliable low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Check them out today at rockauto.com. I'm back again with Bailey Burmaster. And Bailey, you were talking about Evan Mobley's growth and maybe some of the concerns just of him maybe hitting a wall a little bit. But I'm... I don't know. Like he, when he was asked about it a while, a while back now, just to really quantify things like pre all-star break, he, like you said, he has like that. He's a steady Eddie. He's got like a really cool, calm and collected demeanor about him. Like, do you think you're going to hit a rookie wall? And he's just like, I think the rookie wall is just a mindset and I think I'll be fine. And then if you asked his coaches or his teammates, like, Oh no, it's a real thing. It's just your body's not used to playing 82 games. And, I think we saw a little bit of it heading into the all-star break and maybe a little bit after the all-star break. Granted that's without Garland and Rondo too. So it's a little Mm -hmm. hard to fully gauge what a big man looks like, but I, I'm excited to see what his development is because playing him at the five for the Cavs has been a really interesting step in his development overall, because JD said his biggest takeaway from like how he handled Zubac, who's a traditional big man for the Clippers and like, really likes to bang down low and really likes to just 
impose his will on opponents. Like Mobley handled that contact and kind of played through a lot of that contact. Like, and I noted this last night while watching the game. Like, it's the first time I watched Evan Mobley actually get vocal with the refs about a non-call on him because Zubac like fouled him hard. And he's just like, why haven't you guys been calling that all game? And he, he went up and slammed the basketball and like stared them down. And I'm just like, you know what, man? Just speak your truth. Like, beat your chest. Like, speak it up. Like, I know you're an Oklahoma State person. You are a Cade Cunningham gal. I was a big Cade person coming into the draft. Um, a lot of draft experts said that if Cade wasn't in last year's draft class, Mopley would have been the first pick. And I, I don't know. It's – Interesting to think because Kate's had an incredible rookie season too. I'm sure you've been following it just because mm-hmm. you're an Oklahoma State fan and in yourself. But Evan Mobley's really freaking good. Like I know that's such a hot take, but like he's so freaking good and he's so <laughs> well, mature just, in his advance for his age too. So it's really funny. I this is I guess like kind of my hot take. I hate comparing athletes and sports because I oh, feel I like. I think every athlete brings something different to the table. And there might be like little nuances of each person's game within someone else. You know, mm-hmm. people compare Baker Mayfield to Brett Favre in ways and like, you know, all that. So I hate actually comparing Cade and Evan. Um, and maybe just from following Cade in college um, and now in the NBA, like I've always thought he was talented but I can't help but watch this Cavs team and just think what a home run with Evan Mobley. And the thing I love is just like being so young. And I mentioned like that ego list, he's really set a tone and you mm-hmm. can really see him going, like you said, from being in the five spot. And, you know, I think something even bringing up with what we were just talking about, like, I think JB even said it like he's just it's learning to play through contact and you saw mm-hmm. a little bit of that and I just thought that was huge and like the he shows so much promise which I think is so exciting too yeah if you can see growth and see how coachable he is right now and he's a rookie what does the future hold that's the thing what does the future hold because I just say if you get him on that Giannis workout plan, he's going to be unstoppable in two or three years. Like if he adds a little bit of bulk to him. Yeah, exactly. And he maybe that and adds a little bit more of a reliable three-point shot to his repertoire. Like I talked to a scout before the season. They're just like, yeah, he could be an MVP one day. And like people are already talking about him. Like he needs to be on an all-defensive team. And he's only 19, 20 years old. Like he said, he's only a rookie. And we're having these conversations. Like he's been in the league five, six years, and he's finally coming into his own. And I think that's just the thing, like you said, where the Cavs hit a home run, and this might be my hot take, but I don't think the Cavs are in this position right now if they don't have Evan Mobley on their roster. Like They could have Cade Cunningham or Jalen Green and be pretty well off long-term, obviously, but I just think Mobley does so many little things like just off that just cannot be like measured with a box score. Like You have to watch him play. That like He just makes them better. And I think what you're getting at is – there's something galvanizing for a team about the promise of a young individual who's talented and shows you what your future can be. And I Mm -hmm. really think that's putting a lot on Evan Mobley, but because he's egoless and he's willing to learn and he's super coachable and how he's playing, I think he's a key part to what's really galvanized this team. Uh, on top of that, you know, JB's done an amazing, amazing di- job and the system they've put in place to make it work with the players they have and going af- after Levert. They've done so many things right this season to get the ball rolling. But I think Mobley, it starts with Mobley. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, I really I think, agree. I think if you get someone else, this overall, I don't want to say they wouldn't be where they are now, but like, I do think it's a vastly different scenario. I do. It's an interesting thought exercise because what if Houston takes Evan Mobley and the Cavs end up with Jalen Green? I still think they're in a good position. I just maybe they're not flirting with a top record in the Eastern Conference for the better part of the first half of the season. Like they, they're in a good place, obviously, because I think no matter what, Darius Garland is going to have like this superstar leap of his, and Jared Allen's going to show a little bit more of his game that you expected. Like it's obvious to expect or natural to expect. I should say that these young guys show like tangential growth and just and continue. This is their job. They're going to be honing their craft 24, seven, 365. 
And on top of that, like, you know, I don't know Jalen Green. I don't interview him or talk to him or have a mm-hmm. vibe. And I'm not saying he's in any way, like, toxic or anything. I'm just oh, saying no. how perfect of a fit is Evan Mobley to the culture that was being instilled exactly. at the time and still developing, uh, you know, just a guy who's quiet, does his job, coachable, wants to learn, and gets it done on the court at the same time. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of getting it done on the court, before we head out of here for the last few minutes, let's talk about this game against Philly. I think it's going to be a, a tough test for the Cavs. I think Isaac Okoro is going to have a fun time matching James Harden's minutes, but I'm really intrigued to see Evan Mobley's kind of just pseudo growth as a five all of a sudden, having to probably spend the majority of the night defending Joel and B. Like, are you interested to watch that too? Oh man, it's like what I put when I was looking at this game in the notes and, you know, how do they slow and how does Mobley do with Embiid with Allen out? I think it's, I think it's going to be a real test. Oh yeah. Um, And I don't think it takes away from anything we've talked about with Mobley, but um, I I mean, that's, that's the matchup you're watching, right? I mean, it comes down to matchups at points and um, how is Mobley going to fare? Yeah, that's, really interesting to think about too and i wonder if the Cavs tried not to beat themselves in this one because you saw jb's frustration come to a head with the officiating and i think when you play the 76ers you have to go in knowing that like listen james harden and now joel Embiid, frustratingly are going to get a lot of foul calls and they're going to be at the free throw line a lot and you can't let the frustration of not getting calls on your end kind of defeat you because I think this is a winnable game for Cleveland. Like they played Philly tough both times they played them this year so far. And again, it's weird that they haven't played till this point in the season, but I'm intrigued to see, like you said, it is a matchups thing. Like I'm really going to watch Embiid versus Mobley. I'm curious to see how Mobley handles him because Embiid took Jared Allen to work consistently. We talked about it a little bit post all-star that like Jared Allen was kind of banging back a little bit during the all-star game. And like, that was encouraging, but I am also interested to see the James Harden factor of all this because Isaac Okoro has been really freaking good for the Cavs just on def- defense all season long. I think he, him kind of coming out of his shell a little bit just made him fun too. Like him talking himself as like an elite defender. Like he's just like, I don't get hurt when he had that nasty fall last night against the Clippers. Yeah. But um, I think this is going to be like, he's going to be a key piece for the Cavs come playoff time. Cause I think no matter who Cleveland ends up facing, whether it's in the play in or the playoffs, JV's going to say, okay, Isaac, I need you to go out there and defend their best perimeter player for probably 40 plus minutes and do this for a seven game series. If you want to get him a taste of the playoffs, I think you're going to have to do that again with James Harden. I I think you're exactly right. And so I I think we're going to get a good taste of um, what's on the table come this game. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's winnable for the Cavs or do you think this is going to be uh, the sky is falling for some fans afterwards. Cause like you said, Cleveland fans are, they're like going down on the roller coaster. They just, they go all the way down. Like this is like a roller coaster tycoon scenario. They designed their parks for like the, just the cars just go straight down to the ground. If they lose. You're, you're, you're not wrong. Um, uh, <laughs> let me think. I, you don't have to give an answer I'm, if you don't want to. No, I, I, I think it's all about containing James Harden. Yeah, I do too. Like a I, matchup with Embiid, like can you contain him? He's gonna get his shots up, um, but can you contain him? And I think it helps that they're at home. I do. I think I think it um, does too. And they're sixteen and four at home this year, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. That, that that that's wild. So yeah, that's I, it's it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be tough without a doubt. They're gonna need a gritty performance to pull it up. There, they see to pull it a little more with that JV Bickerstaff grit. But Bailey, I want to thank you again for your time. And before we go, tell everyone where they can find you, share what you've been working on, just anything you want to talk about. The floor is yours. Yeah. So, uh, 19 News on CBS, usually your 6, 10, and 11. We also have Overtime, our digital show, where we break down everything, especially with, you know, Cavs, free agency with the Browns. Um, you know, March Madness getting underway, trying to uh, give Akron some love and Enrique Freeman, a Cleveland kid who, you know, killed it in the MAC championship tournament. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It's full blown basketball from this. Yeah, you know, you know. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> so it's a uh, full blown March Madness. Like I know that's a cliche, but March Madness in every sense. No, it's not a cliche at all. And no, check out her work for real. Uh, over time, you've probably seen my mug on there a few times too. But uh, you're probably going to see a lot more Bailey going forward. I think she and I are just going to kind of co-depend on each other just when we need a co-host or something in a pinch. But I want to thank her again for coming on. And thank you guys for, again for making Locked on Cavs your first listen every day. Later this week, Chris and I will be breaking down more of this schedule. Hopefully if his throat recovers by then. I mean, reenacting the bear scene for the Revenant is quite a bit. But – now make your second listen locked on NBA. Locked on experts covering the biggest stories around the NBA every Monday through Friday in less than 30 minutes. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Honestly, probably the same spot you find locked on Cavs.